Um, now over to Pam Locke, who is a lecturer at the uh, Department of English Colonialism at the University of Bristol. Her research interests focus on Victorian literature and the history of drink and drinking, so quite an apt uh, um, field here in Bordeaux. Uh, in 2019, she successfully uh, completed her PhD on, quote, the habitual drunkard in Victorian fiction and culture. So, over to you, Pam. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me okay? Is that close enough? Okay. So, um, people always smile when they hear what I work on. Uh, so my research, as John Philippe mentioned, uh, focuses on alcohol in Victorian fiction and culture. And I'm always impressed by Stevenson's nuanced and complex approach to this ambiguous element in our material culture. One of the reasons I find out the role of alcohol in our society so fascinating is this ambiguity. Drinking and drunkenness are considered by many as essential to some of our most sacred ri rituals, weddings, christenings, f funerals, etc and at the same time are vilified as the cause of um, the most extreme suffering in our communities. I'm actually really excited to be giving a paper on Stevenson's approaches to the pleasures of alcohol. As Jean-Philippe mentioned, I mostly work on drunkards and alcoholism, so it's really good. Um, although he's a favourite author of mine, I've been away from his work for a few years, uh, so please forgive me if I'm a little rusty. Uh, this conference is an excuse for me to return to his works. Um, and fall a little in love with him again, of course, um, in preparation for a future project. Um, I think we're all aware of the overly serious conclusions about his relationship with alcohol personally that some critics have reached based on the many tongue-in-cheek references in his letters and the many drunkards in his fictions. This is not to say that Stevenson didn't appreciate the dangers of habitual drunkenness, or alcoholism as we would call it now. Um, but he understands that drinking behaviours exist on a wide spectrum. My title talks of reframing. Uh, I just want to reassure you I don't mean this in an extreme way. It's just really refreshing to be talking about the positive side of drinking. In context, the quotation in my title may not seem like a favourable starting point for a paper on the pleasures of drinking. A couple of you have mentioned his famous quote on bottled poetry, which would perhaps have been a more obvious choice. Um, but I'm just as interested in the pleasures of sharing drink and in Stevenson's love of the display of drunkenness as I am in the more individual pleasure um, implied by this description. Many of you will be aware that um, this quotation comes from Kidnapped. The narrator, David Balfour, is describing his alliance with Mr. Riach on board the Covenant. Um, David states, getting him in a favourable stage of drink, for indeed he never looked near me when he was sober, I pledged him to secrecy and told him my whole story. He declared it was like a ballad, that he would do his best to help me, that I should have paper, pen and ink, and write one line to Mr Campbell and another to Mr Rankila, and that if I had told the truth, ten to one he would be able, with their help, to pull me through and set me to my rights. In some ways, a favourable stage of drink refers to the results for David rather than the actual drinker, Riag. A favourable stage of drink in Mr Riag allows David to safely and successfully ask for help. And a favourable stage of drink in this case is not only a generous mood, but a creative one. Riag's peer poetic response to David's story, that it was like a ballad, is the precursor to his offers of help marking it, making it seem almost like a justification or even his reasoning. In the scenes on board ship and through the naive eyes of David, the reader clearly sees React's worrying uh, relationship with alcohol. The implication is that he drinks to assuage his guilt and is damaging his health in the process. However, Stevenson um, c describes his reaction to alcohol favourably in terms of mood and behaviour in comparison to the other two leaders on the ship. Indeed, I found there was a strange peculiarity about our two mates, that Mr Riach was sullen, unkind and harsh when he was sober, 
and Mr. Shewan, who would not hurt a fly except when he was drunk. Drinking, sorry. Um, I asked about the captain, but I was told drink made no difference upon this man of iron. Lovely. Like many of Stevenson's, mo Stevenson's most malevolent characters, the captain is unaffected by alcohol, needing it neither to do or to countenance his inhuman acts. And if you're interested in this aspect, I've written about this phenomenon in relation to Long John Silver and the Master of Ballantrae in my chapter on Stevenson in the Italian edited collection, Transgressive Ap Appetites. I mention this because it's quite difficult to get outside Italy, so if, if anybody's interested, you can email me and I'll send it to you. Um, anyway, so uh, Mr. Shewan is a more typical Victorian drunkard, seeking, drinking, uh, seeking drink to cope with the hard life on board ship, but moved to anger and violence when drunk. Mr. Ria is quite different, unkind and harsh when sober. He becomes benevolent and generous when in a favourable stage of drink, and I promise that's the last time I'm going to say that. Uh, Stevenson's comparison between these three drinkers exemplifies a complex spectrum of human reactions to alcohol, demonstrating his nuanced understanding of the diverse effects of alcohol on the body and mind. As you will be aware, he writes plenty of drunkards and drunken misfortunes in his fiction. The pirates in The Masters of Ballantrae and The Blackbeard, as well as those in Treasure Island, Fettis and McFarland in The Body Snatchers, The Doomed Sailor at the end of The Bottle m m Imp, and of course uh, the uh, uh, seaman in um, uh, The Ebb Tide. However, in this paper, as I've said, I'll focus on his attention to the pleasures of alcohol, to the benefits of drinking in his opinion, which can best be summed up as conviviality, relaxation, and health. And I'm going to start with health. So, as the author of the now famous pirate song, Yo Ho Ho and a Bottle of Rum, Stevenson was aware of the dangers of drink and the association of drinking with trauma and ill health. Stevenson's drunkards are well aware of the dangers of habitual drunkenness. They know that drink and the devil are closely associated and that too many bottles of rum are trouble for the mind, body and soul. After all, the only threats to life and the courage for Flint in Treasure Island are rum and the sea cook. The song's cautionary tale reveals the personal histories of his pirates. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of rum. I'm not a very good pirate, I apologise. Um, in singing it, the surviving pirates painfully relive their experiences, yet the repetition also seems to hold an irresistibly comforting power similar to the therapeutic properties of the rum with which they are medicating themselves. This compulsive behaviour humanises the pirates, demonstrating their frailty and the emotional toll their misdeeds have had on their psyches. However, his drunkards make a choice to drink for relief, from their physical and psychological pain, even before addiction makes it difficult to resist the drug. They weigh the benefits against these risks. Stevenson also admitted in a late letter to Baxter that when I lived in San Francisco, I found I must never have a drop of anything to drink in the house, for in my black isolation and gloom, I could not measure what I was taking. Although useful for other forms of mental and physical pain, true gloom must not be dosed with alcohol. It was a dangerous medicine for depression, at least for him. However, Stevenson was also personally aware of the medicinal uses of alcohol. Booth and Mayhew describe him giving champagne to the seasick passengers on the ship to America. In 1888, he writes to Baxter asking his wife to provision them with wine and turtle soup for the female invalids in his house. And in 1881, he writes to his partner, uh, parents of, uh, from Davos to reassure, reassure them uh, that Mrs. Sitwell's son, I think we're going to hear a bit more from, about Mrs. Sitwell tomorrow, aren't we, um, is being well cared for, um, stating that uh, the doctors are doing their best by forcing nourishment into him, including a bottle of brandy a day. This last prescription may seem extreme, but remember that 10 years later, doctors like Dr. Granville were writing to the D Times objecting to temperance campaigns against the medicinal use of alcohol and claiming that the organism, that is the human body, needed alcohol. As James Neal points out, Granville blamed weak constitutions on anti-drink campaigning and the growing popularity of light wines, which he saw as unhealthy. 
this series of letters received angry responses, of course, um, but there's no question that the medicinal value of alcohol was a key belief in Britain until well into the 20th century. Looking specifically at his own medical guides from Stevenson's library, that is, Henry Hartshorn in Essentials of the Philosophy and Practice of Medicine from 1871 advocates the use of wine and beer as stimulants for the sorts of medical issues Stevenson suffered from and goes into particular detail on dosages uh, for those with respiratory illnesses. Stevenson's letters reveal the extent to which he uses alcohol as part of his medical regimen. In 1881, Stevenson tells Baxter, my health is just not what it should be. I have lost weight, pulse, rep rep respiration, and gained nothing in the way of my old bellows. But these last few days with tonic, cod liver oil, better wine, there is some better now, and perpetual beef tea, I think I have progressed. By 1883, he is increasingly tired of his own sickness and writes to Baxter describing his affectionate pseudonym, Thompson, in the third person and in ribald Scots. Thompson's better, I believe, but the body, body's fair attenuated. He's doomed to seven stain 11, and he sucks a wire at cod liver eel till he's a fair disgrace. You see, it's taken in a draft brandy, and it's my belief it's just an excuse for a dram. But the creature was I at drunken. That's Will Kent and smashing to it. The use of the pseudonym and the Scots reinforce the tongue-in-cheek nature of this statement. He wants pity for his attenuated body, but he also wants to make it clear that his physical illness has not dulled his mental capacity or his wit. He still wants to make his friends laugh, and he does so by recalling his fondness for drink in the self-effacing and funny, just an excuse for a dram. Even when he's not allowed alcohol, he toasts his friend in fantasy, again trying to reassure him of his continuing humanity and illness. I had a real mean day following the one I saw you, lying on a sofa and spitting blood like winking, a most depressing employment. Here's to you, in fancy, no drink handy. The liver slightly inactive, tongue clogged, but the human heart, sir, still in the right place. Drink anchor, anchors him to normality on his sickbed. Alcohol is also important for strength in his stories. In Kidnapped, Alan and other characters give David alcohol regularly for a range of maladies, from fear to fever. At first it makes him ill, as he is seemingly more used to beer at table than the fiery spirits of the Highlanders. At the first house he encounters after his farcical marooning on the islet, um, David describes himself as thrown in a strong sweat and a deep slumber by the drink he is served. In the dramatic scene when they must jump from the rock in the river to hide from the soldiers, David describes, Alan had set the brandy bottle to my lips and forced me to drink about a, a, a gill, which sent the blood into my head again. Then, putting his hands to his mouth and his mouth to my ear, he shouted, hang or drown, and they both jump. Alan later chooses to preserve the brandy rather than tip it out to use the bottle for water, arguing that it's been a good friend to you this night, or in my poor opinion, you'd be still cocking on that young stone. When David and Alan arrive sometime later at Cleaning McPherson's cage, David is exhausted and describes the temporary sucker uh, that spirits give him, which allow him to eat. No sooner had I taken out the dram than I felt hugely better and could look on and listen, still a little mistily perhaps, but no longer with the same groundless horror and distress of mind. David goes into what he describes as a trance on which he blames the food and drink before succumbing to the fever which allows Alan to con his money out of him to continue gambling with Clooney. What with the brandy and the venison, a strange he heaviness had come over me, and I had scarce lain down upon the bed before I fell into a kind of trance, in which I continued almost the whole time of our stay in the cage. When Alan moves David to the house of the McLarens to convalesce, David describes in detail an old Scotch drink called Athol Bros. I'm so sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. I'd love to hear how I should say it. Uh, I meant to ask someone. Um, consisting of old whiskey, strained honey, and sweet cream, slowly beaten together in the right order and pr proportion. The whiskey has usually been so used to soak uh, so oats in it, sorry, um, to soften it, 
uh, like a present day barley water, making the final drink ideal for convalescents. Although Alan and Robin Ogue make a good night of it with the traditional mixture as well, as it fuels their piping competition. Again, the medicinal properties of this mixture echo the more formal mixtures advocated in Stevenson's medical book by Hartshorn, who states that when it can be done, alcoholic stimulus is best given with nourishment, as in milk or beaten up with raw egg. And he shares a recipe for milk punch, which is made of milk and spirits. David's case is particularly interesting, as this, his transition from boyhood to something approaching adulthood is charted partly by his changing relationship with alcohol and conviviality. At the beginning of the book, he struggles to drink in company in a range of ways. By the end of the novel, he sits confidently over his wine after dinner with Mr. Ranquila like a gentleman as they plan their retribution on his uncle. And moving on to conviviality and relaxation, we all know conviviality is extremely important to Stevenson. It sometimes seems to me that he talks about companionship and good wine more than anything else in his letters, but perhaps I'm biased. And it permeates his travel writing and his novels. The advantages of alcohol and intoxication in good company are emphasised regularly, sometimes to contrast bad or damaging behaviour, but often to demonstrate the pure value of these pleasures for their own sake. In Jekyll and Hyde, the moderate enjoyment of alcohol is often positively contrasted to the other unnamed vices we see glimpses of in the story. Our first encounter with Jekyll um, is at one of our pleasant, of his pleasant, pleasant dinners. The company is deemed good with three descriptors. They are intelligent, reputable men, and all, good ju all judges of good wine. And this idea of connoisseurship being a requisite for a good dinner party matches the new list of rep requisites of the gentleman by the latter part of the 19th century. On the other side of the coin, Stevenson's dislike for teetotalers is well documented. In the wrong box, Mr Chandler warns his landlord friend that Uncle Joseph is worse nor a temperance lecturer, that being the worst sort of bore. And Stevenson's uh, advice in Virginia, Virginibus Puresque uh, has of course been uh, quoted at tedium. Lastly, and perhaps this is the golden rule. Oh, sorry, that's, that's my recipe for you. There we go. Lastly, and this is perhaps the golden rule, no woman should marry a teetotaler or a man who does not smoke. It is not for nothing that ignoble tabagie, as M Michelet calls it, spreads all over the world. Michelet rails against it because it renders you happy apart from thought or work. To provident women, this will seem no in evil influence in married life. Whatever keeps a man in front of the, in the front garden, whatever checks wandering fancy and all inordinate uh, ambition, whatever makes for lounging and contentment, makes sure, just so surely for domestic happiness. The second half of this quotation is less well known, and in this context the most important. For Stevenson, lounging and contentment is the ultimate form of domestic happiness and can be guaranteed by his two favourite intoxicants. He returns to this letter, this um, point in a, uh, on a more personal note in a letter to his mother in the following year. But I keep better spirits. I love my home and my garden and my hills and my table wine and my wife and my dog. His contentment is clear and we can but enjoy the order in which he places his favourite pleasures. Stevenson's love for the pleasures of wine is often expressed nostalgically bringing back fondly remembered drinking scenes from his early, his younger days. Indeed, drinking stories are a sort of touchstone to recall good times to his friends. In a letter to Lowe in 1883, he recalls a particular batch of Fleury, a well-known wine from the Beaujolais area. Times are a little changed with all of us since the ever memorable days of love and new, hallowed by his name, hallowed by his old Fleury by which you did not see, I think, as I did, the glorious apotheosis, advanced on a Tuesday to three francs, on Thursday to six, and on Friday, swept off holus bolus for the proprietor's private consumption. Well, we had the start on that proprietor. Many a good bottle came our way, and was, I think, worthily made welcome. A few months later, he playfully blames what he self-effacingly describes as his little works on this love of pleasure in a letter to Lowe again. It is idle to pretend 
I love fun, wine, debauchery, and slumming from my soul's center. But if Villon, for example, had continued to be an honest man, we should not now look, almost with pity, on that pitiful apology for a life's work. Art is a virtue, and if I were the man I should be, my art would, raise, uh, would rise in the proportion of my life. Um, but here I remain with my little vices and my little works, the one debasing and the other debased, my own ridiculous victim and poor parody. By comparing himself to the infamous violent and criminal Villon, um, who Lucio talked about uh, very ably earlier, um, Stevenson is again making it clear that he is toying with his reader. Um, he's taking that very Scots approach to boast of his love of drinking while, with one hand while flashing his understanding of the possible dangers of drunkenness with the other. In his reflections on his art, such as Essays in the Art of Writing, he makes it clear that he believes that art requires hard work, dedication, and attention to detail. So this claim to low that art is a virtue is a conceit. Although for him, a writer has the potential to do great good or great harm, he emphasizes that fiction is influential because it is without dogma. And so it is, this position with, uh, so it is with his position on drinking which I think is why it's so thought-provoking and subtle. Stevenson presents us with a wide range of drinkers, and we can come to our own conclusions about the results of their drinking, and whether in each case the harm is worth the benefit. 